Sarah, welcome to the Arca Speak podcast. Great to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Before we get into the meat of this episode, the project types, mixed use, multifamily residential, I would love it if you could introduce yourself to the audience and give us a little bit of your background. Sure. So I have worked in the interior design field um, for almost coming up on 20 years. I have a heavy hospitality background, so I've worked in hospitality nationwide here in the U.S., um, and I've done a fair amount of very high-end residential. Um, and now working for TCA, we work mostly on multifamily um, residential that comes sort of with a mixed-use bend and also some hospitality projects as well. And where are you located? Where's TCA headquartered out of? Sure. So TCA, um, our headquarters are technically in Irvine, California. So we're in Orange County. Um, but we have offices in Los Angeles, Oakland, and now Honolulu. Ooh, wow, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good remote office. Yeah. Um, well, my next question, just just to kick us off here, is can you give it, you said multifamily, you said mixed use, but can you just paint a picture of what size projects you're talking about and, and just give us an idea of the types of projects that you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. So I lead the interiors studio, I should say, I should have said that first for TCA. TCA architecture obviously has has mostly an architecture arm to it. And between architecture and interiors, we're working on multifamily. Um, that could mean anything from a brand new high rise in a downtown urban area that has seven or 800 units in it. It could be luxury. Um, it also means walk-up buildings that are affordable housing that um, have more of a sprawling infrastructure to them. Um, when I say mixed use, I mean that oftentimes our projects will have requirements to have, you know, retail um, or restaurants or elements at the bottom of them. Um, oftentimes we could even have um, multifamily in one part of the project as a tower. Um, hospitality, you know, maybe a, a hospitality brand comes in and has a component of part of the, de the overall development. Um, and then, you know, mixed use uh, could be a, everything from retail to a grocery store to restaurants um, down below. Does multifamily also encompass like a student housing or graduate housing component potentially as well? Yep. So we also work on student housing um, and those can be directly with the university. Uh, they could be offsite. So, you know, both public and private universities um, and so in those, the, you know, the elements of those projects are all very similar. So all of those types of multifamily projects have units. Um, they have amenity spaces. They have indoor spaces, outdoor spaces. Um, so they're all different, but within the same family. That's a perfect segue into, I think, where we should start, which is let, let's talk about the things that kind of thread between all these project types before we jump into each one. So you mentioned outdoor spaces, amenity spaces, and maybe you can kind of talk about those in a generic sense of how would they apply to all of those project types. Sure. So because I have done so much hospitality, I often liken it to that or everyone knows what the experience is to stay at a hotel, right? So sometimes, you know, there's an arrival sequence always with multifamily, whether you're a student housing, affordable, you know, mid-rate, market rate, luxury, there's always an, an approach. Um, you're always entering into some sort of a lobby that might have a leasing aspect to it. Um, you know, if it was a condo building, it would be a sales office. Um, if it's luxury, it's it might be quite a nice leasing amenity space. So you always have that component. As you enter the lobby, we often have what we refer to as sort of a money shot. So there's that component of tying in the interior and the exterior right away. If there's a pool, mm. perhaps in the courtyard or a really great view, and you could really liken that to the same as hospitality. You know, maybe you enter this yep. beautiful lobby and then all of a sudden there's this opening of doors and you have the view of the mountains if, if you're staying in a mountain resort or, you know, there's always that element and that really draws people in. And of course, there's a sales component to it. So you want people to to want to lease at your property and um, you want to have new residents. And so that's part of that immediate experience. Um, amenity spaces are both indoor and outdoor. So we have everything from club rooms where you could have 
television components, games. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later, but everything from a golf lounge to a spa, um, oftentimes those are located directly adjacent to an exterior um, area that could be covered and is maybe an extended part of that lounge, uh, but also could tie to a pool. And those pool decks, you know, they could be on the ground floor, they could be on the 10th floor, on the roof deck. It really depends on the type of product that we're building. Um, if, you know, if it's a wrap building or a, a walk up or a high rise. One of the things that you said that I think is that I wanted to key into is this idea of first impressions. So you're really thinking about, because people don't own here or rent here yet, a lot of times the, the cycle begins with the tour, the sales. And so you're really trying to make a great first impression. You talk about the money shot, right? It's like, right. what's their experience? What do they see when they walk through the doors? Or what happens when the doors open? And you're really trying to to grasp them kind of emotionally even sure. on some level. Yeah, I mean, if it's an exterior Entrance, um, you know, is there a port of cashier? Where are they parking? Do they have the right wayfinding? Um, our studio mm -hmm. starts to touch all of that. Uh, wayfinding can be so related to the branding of the building. Um, and, you know, so that all of those uh, components of what that looks like, the color scheme and the graphics, all start to tie together from the minute that you that you roll in and park your car. Um, I mean, sometimes, just like a hotel, you could even be greeted with a concierge service. Um, or somebody mm -hmm. who will park your car for you, a valet service out front. And so just the branding of all of that experience as you start. And, and then we'll really think about the experience. Is somebody brought into the leasing office first? Are they brought into a lounge first to hang out while somebody comes to greet them? Are they greeting them with an iPad? Um, you know, which, which tour path are they taking to see, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, um, and then, of course, those units, those model units um, are furnished. And so what is, how does that get furnished so that that fits into the brand of the property as well? You've mentioned a few different amenity type spaces that have always, I think, I'll, I'll say always in air quotes because this is maybe just my perception, have been indoors. And now I think I think the trend is that a lot of these are going more, you know, between indoor and outdoor or outdoor completely sometimes. Can you talk about that shift that's been happening and what kinds of amenity spaces it applies to? Sure. So I think we're seeing we're seeing a lot more, um, I would say, gaming, almost gaming and lounge spaces outside for sure. And that, uh, you know, the pool deck is always an easy example. Maybe there's cabanas. Um, maybe the cabanas are fully enclosed or are and more of an architectural element than what we would usually consider an FF&E element, right? And inside those cabanas, there might be an opportunity to rent them for um, to have your own barbecue or to have your own set of dining tables outside. Um, but we're also seeing so much of that on, you know, even if you can get little pockets, we call them sky decks on the building. And those could even just be on a three-story building or four-story building. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a sky rise. Um, and so what can you get in 1,500 square feet on the corner of the exterior of a building? And those are really big draws to even just be able to put a trellis up there, have an outdoor fire pit and TV and and what else can you cater to? Or I guess the the draw to with those types of spaces is to create more intimate zones for residents to want to gather. Or mm -hmm. just, you know, maybe you, you're working from home and you want to just have a shady spot to go answer some emails. Um, so we're always trying to create that indoor-outdoor. I think fitness is always probably the other location that we're constantly seeing, you know, the request for uh, doors that bifold all the way open and keeping equipment outside or being able to bring them outside or offering outdoor, um, you know, deck locations for yoga classes. Oftentimes these properties will bring in um, fitness amenities or like a fitness program as part of their fitness space. So let me ask you, you know, with the kind of expansion of outdoor spaces as an amenity, um, I know you don't just do things in California, but do you also look at ways of making those as 365 day spaces or three season spaces or things like that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when the climate permits, 365 day spaces are great. Um, we obviously are fortunate to have a lot of that in some of our markets. Um, we do work a lot in California um, and in Hawaii, uh, but we also have projects in the Midwest and the Northwest and um, 
those clients are asking for the same outdoor spaces. And then it just becomes uh, the question of weathering them, you know. I think I mentioned earlier the outdoor cabanas. Can the cabanas be architectural structures that are truly covered with heating, mm -hmm. fans, misters, whatever that climate requires? Um, and that would sort of carry from a lounge space to a fitness space. You know, it still needs to be semi-enclosed um, so that they can use it as much as possible. That's always the goal. They really want to use it as much as possible. And we see that even in climates where it snows. They still yeah. want the doors that are opening all the way up. Um, hmm. and get people outside as much as they can. Those Midwesterners are special breeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Having moved to Oregon recently, I, I still see people in the middle of winter walking around T-shirt and shorts, and I'm just like, how, how do you do that? <laughs> 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 so so the question, I guess, then is, how, how are you accomplishing that? Because it's more than just having a thick skin, right? There are building products and things that go into this, but... Are you, are you talking about movable barriers that are easy to take up and put pull down? Are you talking about, give us kind of some ideas of the different things that you're using to deal with the inclement weather conditions where people want to be outside still? Sure. Um, so shade structures for sure. And those could be as simple, you know, we're working on a renovation right now where we have a great roof deck, but it is so sun beaten and they just have no, they're, it's not in their budget to build architectural elements up there right now. So we're using sunshades, but we're doing them in a really unique way, and it's meeting their budget. It's giving their residents a whole new dining experience up on their fifth floor um, roof deck. Built-in heat, of course, always is preferred. Um, I would never prefer to have a space heater hanging out on a patio. Um, so, yeah. yeah, wherever we can get those, and there's so many options now with electric and gas and custom colors. I mean, you can really get whatever you want as long as you plan mm -hmm. for it and coordinate it during the design process. Sun studies, I guess I didn't really mention that before, but we always do sun studies, especially on our roof decks um, and main sort of exterior thoroughfares to see, is someone really going to be able to be out there? And if they aren't, you know, can we get some sort of a louvered roof structure? You know, maybe the loopers open mm. and close or pull open and shut with a fabric. Um, I think there's so many products on the market now that there's really a lot of choices um, it always comes down to budget and um, yeah, and what will survive. It seems like flexibility, products that are flexible by nature can give you a little bit more leeway in the design, right? And, and it's easier to sell a client even on an outdoor space and amenity when they have options throughout the year to adjust their space. Yeah. And, you know, yes. Yeah, so definitely adjusting it for... Um, the time of year, but also, you know, properties often want to change what they're using those spaces for over mm -hmm. time. You know, right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. it might be super cool to have a yoga deck and they've got a yoga instructor lined up, but maybe three years from now in that market, they can't sustain that or nobody's taking yoga anymore and now everyone wants to do something else. <laughs> and so just having the ability to have flexible spaces that are um, still usable no matter what they're using them for, it's yeah. really key. Something we get asked for a lot, indoor and outdoor. They, they, there's often the ask for spaces that are flexible to change the programming within them. I, I have to say this, that I've done a lot of exterior spaces with a lot of flexible spaces. But honestly, that is the first time I've ever heard the term yoga deck. <laughs> yoga deck. <laughs> it's because you don't work in this in this market segment. <laughs> clearly. Clearly. <laughs> You've mentioned the sun. I all, I would assume wind too. I would assume that like wind tunnels become a thing when you have mul like a campus of buildings or a series of buildings and outdoor spaces between them and that that's got to be something to challenging to deal with as well. Yeah, especially in some of our urban environments. It's sort of those corridors of wind if it the way that it comes in through the buildings. And yeah. there's a, that's something we really study with architecture in the early development stages so that we make sure that, we, you know, whatever walls or structures need to be put in place for the, the programming to be successful in that location, that, that that's addressed. Mm -hmm. Because it's so much harder to do it at the end, you know, near yeah. installing FF&E. And then someone says, wait a second, it's windy up here. No one's going <laughs> to <Yeah>. sit here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Right. So one of the things that, that you mentioned were the kinds of spaces that are people are going to to kind of maybe retreat to, but have a different uh, 
environment if they wanted to work kind of outdoors one day or and I, I assume too because we're talking about multifamily we're talking about families and because of covid and the shift to doing more things in one place than we ever used to right we we used to go to the office we used to go to the fitness center we used to go to do out to eat and do all these things and now those things are all happening in one place I would assume that kind of having the indoor outdoor flexibility and linking of those spaces is important in these family scenarios and people kind of got used to that during covid right and they kind of they they still expect that to be the types of functionality in their spaces still right so having a place to watch the kids play while you're preparing a meal or you know those kinds of examples is that is that the case yes for sure so a lot of our the way that a lot of these buildings for multifamily end up laying out is you often have a series of courtyards throughout the development. Um, and it's great because one courtyard is sunnier in the afternoon and the other one's shadier because of the way the buildings are right. oriented. And so they right. they really offer different vibes or, or moods. And you do see people sort of congregating to, we have this one project, it's so great. And it was almost an accident. It's got this sort of alleyway space that's part of the property, but nobody had really thought of it. And it wasn't until we walked it, we said, this is an awesome spot to hang out. We ended up putting a fire pit there and lights. And and it's like the perfect cozy zone. Um, another good example is in a student housing project that we have, we have a fitness facility that's adjacent to sort of a family area so that the kids can play outside. There's a playground and grass. And, you know, theoretically, mom or dad could be inside getting a quick workout and, and still have sight line mm -hmm. of everybody and what's going on out there. That's cool. There's so much opportunity with, with outdoor, like you, like you said, it was just, you thought it was just an accident, right? That you found it. And I, there's places in the towns around me where I, they have turned these, what used to be like an alleyway, a literal alleyway into an amazing outdoor yep. space with string lights and tables and fire pits and, you know, and, and it's just become, and I think, because people see that more often, then they want that at their place too. And they're asking for those kinds of things or they're actually shopping for those kinds of amenities when they're going out and looking at these places. So yeah, shouldn't be overlooked. This is really, really great opportunity. There. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think of probably some of the best meals you've ever had in Europe or Mexico or, you know, think about those alley streets in San Francisco. They're so awesome with the cobblestones and they're narrow yeah, yeah. and the scale is so important. You know, people want to feel held. You know, grand spaces are good for grand spaces and certain entry experiences, if you right. will. But mm -hmm. you don't always want to sit in a 10-story, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> right, right. You know, where you if you travel to Europe or Mexico City and you see these enormous plazas, it's it's pretty rare to watch people walk across the middle of them. Yeah. Right? Unless they really have to get to the other side. Yeah. They tend to stick to the boundaries and the edges, and they want to be near something. I, I totally know what you're talking about. It's it's it, and it's psychological on some level. It's like you want to be held, like you said. It's just, we don't know why we do it a lot of times, but we just that's just a behavior that that I've observed as well. Yeah. Well, let's do our best in this episode to hit a couple of different categories of project or product types um, to help our audience just understand them better, but also maybe see what's going on in those those different markets. So let's start with multifamily, because we've seen that, you know, outside of urban areas over the last decades, it's mostly been focused on single family residential. Obviously, there's been some apartments and condos, but what is happening now? Where are we? What are you seeing happening in the market for multifamily? I mean, I won't be the expert on explaining all the whys, but Multifamily has been on such an upward trajectory for years now, um, and it's we're really seeing that it's, from a developer's perspective, kind of a home run. And so that's why I think it keeps mm -hmm. getting repeated because people are, people are living, people are renting there. It's it's working, um, you know. And markets have changed obviously in the last call it eighteen months or so. Um, we're, Just a little bit. We're, right. yeah. <laughs> we're also seeing. Um, it, at our firm, we also have the ability to do a lot of affordable housing, but we touch luxury down to affordable and everything in between. And so I think that that's just servicing such a huge range of people um, in all demographics, in all areas. You know, I'm in Orange County and the multifamily market here is is huge. 
Um, I think there's also a little bit of a generational shift with the view of home ownership. And so mm -hmm. I think that plays a role to a certain extent or the ability um, sometimes to own homes in certain parts of the country, for sure. California is mm -hmm. expensive. So let me ask you, in multifamily, are you starting to see a trend, speaking of like it being hard to, for home ownership? I mean, are you seeing any trends towards multi-generational within? I mean, because normally you think about it, it's like, well, a three bedroom, two bath kind of type things. And, and are you seeing any shifts towards multiple generations living in a multifamily development you know, that's really interesting. I don't have a specific example of that, but I do know that some of our clients um, who have, you know, very specific brands speak to this idea that they have multi-generations of people living there that have mm -hmm. decided to be renters, right? Like okay. we are not okay. buying homes. And that is the case for a 25-year-old young professional. And it's the same case that they're seeing for 65-year-old retiree. They mm -hmm. don't want to deal with the home maintenance the amenities that come with the multi-family space are, can be quite incredible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they're seeing repeat residents who sometimes even move within their body of, of properties, right? They mm -hmm. might live in one city of one of their properties and next door for different amenities or maybe work takes them there. But they're almost like you see in hospitality, right? You've got your Marriott points. They're sort of, they like the familiarity of what that brand might offer them. And yeah. so they like to stay within that family, but they're really choosing to stay in the rental market. You mentioned amenities. I think that's the key word that I want to hone in on because uh, that is a big shift over the, the la previous decades of multifamily, I think, in that that is a huge driver of the project and i'm wondering who's doing the driving is it is it the clients is it is it the families or is it the developers being proactive about that are they using that to differentiate so before we get into what the amenities are that you're really seeing happening like where is that coming from is it coming from demand or is it really being driven on the supply side of this equation that's a good question i think demand is different in different markets so we have some projects that are in more urban markets, and especially with, you know, when COVID started, the co-working situation, that became a demand, right? Especially in urban markets as offices emptied out. In some of our maybe more Midwest markets, we're seeing demand for, call it sponsor spaces. So I think it's probably twofold. Developers are trying to get a one-up for their next property, right? What can we offer that they don't have next door? But there's also definitely, you know, everyone's studying, wow, this is really popular at this property. This is really popular at this one. Um, or we're, we're planning on attracting uh, young professionals. We're planning on attracting families. And then that really changes what you're looking at offering. Does your firm just do new ground up projects or do you do retrofits as well? And so, okay, so you're nodding your head. Yes. So when it comes to amenity spaces with these retrofits and renovations, is it is it wholesale changes? Is it just slight updates? There's probably the whole gamut, but I, I would love to hear kind of some some of your experience there as well. Sure. I, yeah, it is the whole gamut. Um, we're working on a property right now that's in the LA area um, that is converting space that was completely unused into sort of this huge clubhouse co-working rentable mm -hmm. uh, space. They happen to have a lot of square footage. And so for them, it's a little bit of a game of return on investment. They're creating spaces that can be rented. And that's actually not just this client that happens for a lot of clients is how can we help yeah. them make money on these amenity spaces? What kinds of functions are they are they using those to rent rent them out for to give people some ideas about topics to bring up if they have conversations around these project types? Because I can imagine, you know, there's like kind of a community center aspect to it, but I imagine there's there's a lot more. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I I think for some of these like clubhouse spaces, for example, they're most of them, you know, I would say are generally open to their community. They want to create community. A lot of these multifamily locations are, they'll even generate events for their um, residents because they want to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And that's a big selling point for a lot of the, a lot of the brands. Um, 
spaces for gathering and they're encouraging that, but then maybe part of it can be, you know, sectioned off and closed down for a private party. Or maybe there's two clubhouses that are adjacent to each other and you enter through different doors and they could both be open unless one gets rented. Um, and so, like, you know, I think you're seeing both. What was interesting is you were talking about the leasable or rentable space for working. And I know Evan wanted to wait to get into some of the amenity stuff, but I think we let's, let's do it. Let's, let's talk about it because, because it's kind of interesting is, is do you, have you seen a shift and, and I know COVID has kind of changed the game in a lot of the way that we approach things, but I mean, are you seeing a demand for like live work type um, scenarios? Yes, I think the short answer to that is yes. Maybe not as much as we were a couple of years ago, um, but I think it's definitely still a topic. And what's been really successful for a lot of our properties is providing smaller potted spaces uh, that can, you know, we call them Zoom rooms or podcasting yep. studios. We do we do a lot of podcasting studios because if people are <laughs> working from home, you're what? in the I don't you know. <laughs> you get a better backdrop than my parking lot over here. Um, I mean, sometimes we even have a property right now that we're working on that has such an amazing view that that's what, this one room, that's why we decided to make it a podcast studio. Um, yep. They have a lot of young professionals that live there. And so mm. those rooms can be rented out, right? And it's small. But then we might also have space for a larger conference room. It can be open when it's not being rented, but it could also be closed down for meetings and maybe you're bringing clients in. Um, some of our properties have the opportunity to have separate exterior entrances to these spaces. Mm. And so you could even have clients come to an address that is not your home, you know? Um, we might also talk a little bit later about zoning, but a lot of our projects you need to have um, a certain level of retail on your ground floor. Okay. Um, and so sometimes you can sort of bend those rules with live work addresses. Interesting. And so mm -hmm. that's something that comes up once in a while too. So is this kind of space consideration that you're talking about being marketed to the people who live there primarily? Mm -hmm. um, does it go beyond that as well? Like if somebody wanted to have their... I don't know if it, it was a development that was just incredible. Could you just have, you could hold a wedding there or a bar mitzvah or I don't know, something from, from somebody outside in the community? Because if they're really talking about engaging with the community, I assume there's some aspect to marketing these beyond yeah. the tenants of, of the, the property. That's a, that's a great question. I don't see a lot of that, but I mean, it reminds me of so many things. I mean, we have roof decks on a lot of our properties. If you mm. go into a hotel roof deck to get married, you know, why not? If the other roof deck looks better, you could mm. might as well just do it there. Or you know how they have resort paths for hotels where you can go use the pool for the day. I mean, most yeah. of our places have all of those outdoor amenities. I don't know the details of insurance and all of that. I don't see a lot of that of them opening it up to um, to outside residents, but it is certainly pretty much, I would say, the selling point for these developers. Um, oh, that's interesting. I, I was going to ask you that because it's it, it seems like that. But I also know I've never done developer work, but I know this is called des the design is actually a spreadsheet, right? And and I'm wondering, like, what are the values placed on these amenities? And it sounds like they're, they're prioritized at I, the top of the list. Yeah, I think they really are. Um, at, and of all levels, right, from luxury to market rate, uh, you know, down to affordable, I really think that it's important now of course, different locations or property types have a different level of that. I mean, some properties yeah. are just going to rent out immediately no matter what because the demand is just so high and mm -hmm. the amenities mm -hmm. might not be as important. Um, of course, floor plans are important for your units. Um, and that's very carefully studied in the early stages about how many studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, maybe even three bedrooms that you have. So it's all important, right? But from a leasing manager's perspective, you know, they're excited to take people on a tour of the property. I mean, that's why, you know, we do get involved as much as we can, um, varies with each project, but when we can get heavily involved in the branding of the property with the maybe ownership's marketing team, a lot of times we start touching the wayfinding. We might even design the entire wayfinding package with a signage consultant because it, it all ties together, right? Yeah. Yeah, Just yeah. as you go to a restaurant and there's a uniform for the yeah. for the um, staff and they might use a certain pad or 
um, whatever emblem is, you know, stitched into their name. And, you know, all of that is, you have those same touch points when you're looking at signage or um, approaching a desk or taking a pamphlet away with you. Well, I mean, if you're trying to create an overall experience, I mean, you really are wanting to curate every bit of that experience from yeah. what does it look like when we drive up to that to that parking space and then traverse through everything and, and how is it staged and seen and, and stuff. So, yeah, it, and this is, again, some of the things that a lot of times architects, because like say if it's working on a specific project and not like a larger kind of like grander experience sometimes misses whereas in other cases like you know i mean we certainly when we were thinking about a say an elementary school or something like that curate that that view all the way through what are the experiences where are these moments where are the things and it's interesting to see that that's something that's kind of taken to an even bigger level when you're talking about like this not just the actual final product but how the, the pre-sale product. Sure, yeah. And we have some projects where they'll um, bring in, you know, a local coffee shop that does, you know, like a coffee cart instead of just having a curate at the front desk. So you have an experience that's related to the neighborhoods. You have that connection there. Um, model units are often another, you know, big thing that gets your opportunity to really finish telling the story because that's where multifamily differs so much from hospitality, right, is you don't have hotel rooms, Mm -hmm. You have sort of very generally neutral units um, that people live in so they can personalize it themselves. But when you have the opportunity to do a model unit, which is part of the sales cycle, you know, you can personalize that unit to go with the story and the property. So it just kind of is that next level of where am I? Does it feel like I'm in Hollywood or Kansas City or, you know, wherever right. I am? You mentioned earlier that you came from hospitality design or you have experience doing that. Is that influencing multifamily now quite heavily? I can imagine as a family who goes on a vacation, maybe to Vegas or something, and I rent a cabana at the side of the pool for a party or, you know, maybe it's a significant birthday or an event or something. And then I come home and the place that I live doesn't have any of that stuff, but what that what was an amazing experience. I'd love to have that more often. I'd be willing to pay a little bit more every month to have that. I would assume that that's influencing this kind of work. Yeah, I think it definitely is. Now, one of the biggest differences, and this affects the design too, is staffing, right? A multifamily development or residence building is not staffed the same way a hotel is. And so you have a lot of spaces that are less manned, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we yeah. have a, we have a developer who has some cafes in part of their repertoire of buildings, uh, properties, and they, um, you know, they have a hard time keeping that a profitable center for them. The residents certainly like it. It brings people together, but you got to staff right. a restaurant. So, um, you know, different people can do it at different levels. I just had this experience in my town the other day where I, I'm doing a remodel in the room next door here. And so I go to all the lumber stores and hardware stores to find the things I'm looking for. And I'll go to Home Depot or Lowe's and I cannot get anybody to help me. I just can't get anybody to help me, to, to your point. I mean, keeping the right number of staff and balancing that to how many customers are there is rough. But I'll tell you what, like I go to this other one across town that is a private one yeah. and somebody is waiting at the door for me <laughs> to help me. And it's like... They're smaller, but they care more. Right. I mean, it's obvious. Yeah. And and because of that, I want to go there and I want to spend my money there and support that because it gives me exactly what I need. Oh, yeah. And so it's not impossible no. to do this, right? It's It it just needs to be a priority for, for these properties and these businesses to, to sure. say that a happy customer is more important or a satisfied customer is more important and more valuable ultimately in the long run. Um, so... Yeah, it's just a business decision, right? But yeah. it's uh, it's it's pretty obvious. Yeah, and I think especially, you know, in the more luxury sector, you have more of an opportunity to do more of that. I mean, we have one client who they want their brand to be known as the hospitality brand for multifamily living. Okay. So they're really kind of going after this concept heavily. They can do it because of where they're located and the clientele that they're after. So you know, mm -hmm. different markets. So, so what are the amenities? This is just 
me thinking about you know, yeah we've future, mentioned a few future but retirement sure others. in oh, okay <laughs> in, in, in places that i might want to selfish question sure yeah <laughs> but i mean you know but he, but i am kind of curious i mean what are like some of the amenities like this higher end more hospitality oriented multifamily sure yeah I think, uh, you know, the rooftop deck is always a hot topic. And what can you put up there? Can you get a pool up there? Mm. Can you get a pool on the fifth floor if you can't put it on the 10th floor? You know, what what can be built in early on? Um, for mini pools do you have, mm. depending on if they're in sprawling development or, or taller? Um, you know, we always sort of generically say clubhouse, but oftentimes there's multiple rooms within a clubhouse or spaces that are mm. divided in sort of a grand space. There's, you know... The hangout, cozier TV zone. Maybe you can rent that room for movies or football games or whatever. Um, usually, that that might have like a full kitchen component. So you can bring in catering, and then maybe there's sort of a larger game room, if you will, um, that's sort of just open to residents at all times. Some of them will staff bars um, at certain for certain events. Maybe they're for the Super Bowl. The the property will actually just bring in a barista or bartenders or whatever it might be. The cabanas, as you said, you know, being able to rent out special zones. Um, it's often, going back to the clubhouse, they often have, you know, maybe a golf room, a screening room hmm. um, connecting to them. Fitness is huge. So people are almost always after the best thing they can get for their buck for fitness. It keeps residents on the property. Um, it also is a huge selling point because now they don't need a gym membership. And so sometimes people like to get bigger with their fitness with more of a spa component that's adjacent to it. Um, could just be simple lockers um, and the sauna room. Uh, some of them have rentable, uh, actually, spa rooms where you can have a masseuse come in or, or have different services be provided. We often see the fitness facilities adjacent to the pool. Um, so that way you kind of have that full indoor outdoor connection and then you know maybe there's a shared walker or bathroom that's useful for the property so i don't know that's sort of a rattling off of of what we've been working on lately but we really do see kind of a wide gamut it depends on what you got to work with maybe we can shift to mixed use because you're talking about some similar components but we're going to add a couple more and and then kind of how it all ties together because you know i i I also think about a place like Disneyland where it's like the music is continuous as you're walking from one function to the other along the walkway and the lighting. And I mean, it's it's another level even of wayfinding because you're adding in deliveries and front doors and back of house and all these other things. So what's going on with mixed use and what, what are some more fundamental considerations that you're making that are that are different from multifamily with that project type? Well, I think um, we're a couple of things with the sort of the term mixed use. I mean, oftentimes our properties uh, for just for TC in general, what we're really good at building are, you know, let's just say it's a new project and the bottom floor has a Whole Foods and then there's a tower with mm -hmm. condos that they're selling. And then there's a tower with apartments and then there's retail space, other retail space on the bottom, because maybe the urban zone that that's in is, requ is required. They want to have more street traffic. And so they have to fill in other retail locations. And so there's sort of all these components that fit into it. Um, the other thing that we see a lot with mixed use is kind of taking the conversion or an addition to these sort of outdoor shopping centers. So adding multifamily mm -hmm. residential into those developments that maybe already exist or maybe they're starting it that way. And so you can just come downstairs and walk straight to the coffee shop do your grocery shopping, have dinner out, and you don't really have to leave the general vicinity. And just like you're talking about Disneyland, I mean, especially in those instances, you're kind of creating Disneyland, right? You can yeah. have the music coming out of the speakers mm -hmm. when you come downstairs. You can have outdoor dining that is connected to your restaurant, that's connected to the elevator that goes straight up to your, your space. And so, um, yeah, I think you're really creating a brand again. You're creating an experience for people who live there and for the visitors who are coming to see them. I'm curious what you find the most challenging aspect of those types of projects are, maybe in the early design stages of it, because it's not like custom residential and it's very different 
project type because of all of these potentially competing uh, traffic circulation and security, I, I would assume, is a, is a big part of this as well, like who can access what and when and where and how. And oh, yeah. so, so what, is, what, is, what do you think are the challenging aspects to this project type? I should have my architecture buddies next to me because <laughs> they would have an answer for the, their beginning of the project, right? And then interiors would have an answer for our beginning. I guess for us, what's not challenging in a bad way, but actually kind of exciting in those types of projects is that you have the opportunity to have multiple clients. So you might have your developer client that you're developing 400 units for, and they've got this retail shopping center, and they're putting in XYZ boutique market, right? Well, now you've got XYZ boutique market going in, and they want you to work on their space, right? So now you kind of have a project within a project. Um, and those are really special for us, especially our studio, because we're kind of boutique anyway. Mm. And so we like mm. to, to touch the individual clients. And are there competing interests there sometimes, or do you really feel like everybody's moving in the same direction and it's... Yeah, no, there can be competing interests, sure. And then, of course, you know, it's sort of like an HOA, you've got rules, mm. you know, somebody wants to paint the corner of, of their restaurant blue, but the other person says, no, we only do black awnings, and, you know, right. so... And got a little bit and of signage, signage, and like there has to, you actually have to develop the standards for yeah. a lot of that stuff because you're going to have different tenants moving in and moving out over the decades, and yeah. they all have to adhere to the look, right, or the the experience that that the property wants to create for everybody, right? Yes, yeah. which is not, you know, it's again, it's just so similar to hospitality. You have a book of standards for a hotel brand, you know, right. if you're staying yeah. at a Westin, you're handed the book of standards that you need to follow to make sure you check all the Marriott boxes, but then you also need to personalize it for the location that you're in and have it feel yeah. special than any other Western that they stay at. So it's the same, right? And then you got to develop that base brand, that base set of standards to follow. I'm interested in, you talked about a project you're doing in LA, and I assume that at least on the West Coast, and this has come up in other episodes in this series, is that there's a big outdoor component, right? You, you've talked a little bit about some of those types of amenities, but is that happening beyond just the West Coast? And, and maybe you can just talk about the the types of changes in design approach that you make, depending maybe on the region that you're putting a project in. But I assume there's a big outdoor component here, but, but where else? Yeah, everybody wants to be outside, right? For as long as you possibly can. Um, we have a slew of current projects that happen to be in the Kansas City area. And does the architecture need to be different to work with the weather? Yes. You know, we have vestibules that you have to walk through and there's different heating and AC components. And, but everybody's asking for doors that fold all the way open. Everybody wants mm -hmm. it, even if you can only use it for four <laughs> months out of the year yeah. instead of, you know, eight or nine. I don't know why we call them California rooms, but we often say that it's a <laughs> California room when you have this sort of completely trellised outdoor area just outside of an interior space, whether it's a clubhouse or a fitness facility or whatever. And and yeah, people want to be out there as, as much as they can. And there's different requests for that, of course, architecturally for what needs to happen in seating components and or cooling components. But um but I, I would say the indoor outdoor is really an ask wherever you are. If it makes you feel any better on the East Coast, we call them Florida rooms. <laughs> the florida room makes me think of the screened in right because then you've got the bugs to deal with well yeah that <laughs> that's usually a component too but now right. now with the advent of kind of like the the roller screens i mean you can yeah. change the whole landscape of kind of how that room really kind of acts i think the other thing too that we see a lot and this is where we sort of cross paths with the landscape designer often is, you know, are we putting in umbrellas or are we building permanent trellises? Mm. Because, you know, if it's a permanent trellis and we can put a covering on it, people can use it, even if it is sprinkling or right. whatever. Versus the umbrellas, they're all going to get taken down. We've got a place to store them. Where are they going? They're going to be destroyed in three years. You know, so there's that, that life cycle products. We all know how the budgets work, right? Yeah, yeah. Does, does it go into the built budget or does it get put into the FF and e, it falls out when you turn it upside right. down budget. It's, it, it's still the same money. You're just trading buckets. 
And, you know, developers are going to start to look at that and they say, well, if it's something that I have to replace in three years, is it something that I want to invest in from day one? Or is that one of the value engineered items that we can then go do something else with? I think we can hit this one quickly, but we, we talked a little bit about when we were brainstorming this episode, uh, student housing. And I have a very specific view on what student housing is. And when I read what was written here, I was kind of blown away by this idea. I had never even considered family student housing oh, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it totally makes sense. Uh, grad students who already have families want amenities in student housing and Cormac, your firm does student yep. housing too, yep. right? And so this was totally new to me. I, maybe you guys can explain this because I, I think it's super interesting. I mean, obviously it makes total sense once you hear it, but but introduce this idea. Yeah, we, well, we do student housing as well. And um, I think with student housing, just as you said, you know, you have, I also have the name, right? I remember my freshman dorm <laughs> and we yeah. do that also. However, you have the range of graduate students, faculty who are living on mm -hmm. campus, yeah. you know, they have families. Mm -hmm. And so just as we're building a quote unquote clubhouse or shared space, we're doing yeah. the same for student housing. And it's a place to gather. It's a place to study. You know, maybe we don't call it a co-working space. It's a study room. Right. But really, it's the same things. There's fitness. Um, you know, maybe there isn't always a pool. Sometimes there is, but maybe there isn't a pool. But there might be outdoor play equipment that's built into the landscape because kids are there. Um, maybe there's a child care component that gets built in. Um, so we, ha we see rooms like that that are often adjacent to these family centers or fitness areas so yeah there's all of that in student housing so let me ask you this from the aspect of do you do a lot of or do you do any kind of like developer student housing because we have seen a huge uptick in the trend for developer student housing or you know kind of basically a p3 partnership between developers who are developing off campus housing but they're also developing it both with the, you know, kind of single or, or almost like dorm type rooms all the way up to family rooms. And then the amenities that come with those of things like the on-site daycare, on-site fitness, on-site health centers and things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you guys have been doing any of that, because I know that you guys do a lot of developer work and we see this huge uptick in, in those kind of projects. Yes. The short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, we have we have developers that we work with that are, um, you know, maybe a lot of uh, there's groups that really focus just on student and, affor and affordable housing, mm -hmm. like that's their niche. And so, yes, that that is a client of ours, as well as direct to, you know, perhaps a private university that's adding dorms or maybe right. a private university that you're contracting with, but then they have to build off campus because they're out of space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so we see that, too. We have we have both types of clients. Yeah, I will I will say there's a, a, a completely different mindset. Now, I'm not in that studio, but I see the work that's going on in that studio. And to see the you know, you were you were talking about, oh, I remember my freshman dorm. I remember my freshman dorm was very similar to my barracks when I was in the army. And <laughs> The freshman dorms, like, you know, where my son is yeah. at school right now is palatial in comparison. And it is all about the experience. It, there are large rooms that are dedicated to more hospitality than just kind of like there are, you know, obviously carved out like student study spaces and in small gathering spaces. But then there's these larger, more hospitality oriented things. And and just to see the difference in what 20 plus and more on the plus side of, of things from what the dorms were when I was a student, it's just, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, to see that, yeah. that shift in it. And, and in fact, I even see universities basically leveling the, the dorms that we went to school in to do these more exactly. amenity based housing developments. Yeah. And there's, I mean, just like there's different clients, right? There's different, you know, public university, private university, they all have mm -hmm. different means to be renovating um, 
and different reasons for drawing in people to be living on campus. Right. And so it really varies what you can do. Sometimes they are a little bit more stark because, I mean, when it comes down to it, you, it's got to be cleanable, wipeable. Yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah. want to replace it for 10 years, you know. Hold up under the abuse. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. It does seem like the big shift has gone from building uh, it very rigorously and about kind of processing a part of a student's life where it was mostly about going to school and classes to now being much more of a draw to even attract students oh, yeah. to the campus yeah. and their families and keep them there and have them, you know, really connecting into the services that are offered when it, if, if it does come to daycare and it does come to food service and it does come to kind of creating a community on campus. It, it's really driving value toward toward that side of it. I think it, it's a very interesting shift, but, you know, comparing it and contrasting oh, yeah. it to the the old days of the dorms, right, yeah. which were which were like little cells in a box. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, the lifestyle of where you're choosing to spend a lot of money <laughs> is, yeah. is important. Yeah. I think you just nailed the word there that I've been searching for here because, and maybe this is, this is what we can wrap up with, but you really are designing, we said experience, but lifestyle is really hits all of these different pieces of multifamily, whether it's strictly multifamily or mixed use or, luxurious sounds very luxurious student housing i mean this it, it's really about creating a lifestyle creating a brand that attracts people who identify with that wanting that lifestyle or it is their lifestyle and they want to maintain that to really draw them in and create space that is uh, going to deliver on all of those different metrics yeah absolutely cool well this has been a, a educational for me, especially <laughs> not having done any of these project types and a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much yeah. for spending the time to, to share this information with our audience. And we'll have links to you and your firm in the show notes for the episode. Is there anything else that you want to mention here before we say our goodbyes? No, it's, just, it's been lovely to chat with you both. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. Thank you for being here. <laughs>